Welcome to App Center, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Luis Quende and Anastasia Belyaeva, who are the co-founders of Nation3. Nation3 is kind of taking up a topic that's been, you know, discussed more and more, this idea of new countries. How do we create uh, new legal systems, new countries, uh, new states? Uh, of course, Balaji has gotten a lot of attention with his description of this as network states. And, you know, Nation3 is actually trying to do it. And they're moving ahead with something like this. So really excited to speak with them and, you know, dive in. What is that going to look like? So just before that, a uh, brief word from our sponsor. So Tally Ho. So Tally Ho is redefining the wallet as a public good. You can think of it a bit like a community-owned alternative to MetaMask. It has a much smoother user experience compared to many other wallets. It has an impressive UI and you can easily see all your account balances at one and swap between assets within the wallet at a much lower price. They also have a great ledger integration and have ENS and UNS domain name support. And recently added the first sidechain with Polygon. And so Polygon support is now automatic and easy to use without having to do any kind of manual step-by-step -step thing. And uh, yeah, you can also enter the metaverse with this, you know, with this Web3 wallet that's fully community owned. So uh, they became the first sponsor of EtherJS, this JavaScript library through a Gitcoin Aqueduct. So go to telly.cash slash download to check it out. And one more thing. So we are hiring at the moment. So we're looking for a community manager for Epicenter to help us grow our audience and, uh, you know, kind of produce a show at a, even higher quality level. So if you're passionate about crypto and creating great content, uh, get in touch. There's going to be a link to the application in the show notes, so you can just uh, reach out there. And yeah, with that, let's get into it. Uh, it's it's so great to have you both on. I've kind of like, I guess, known you both for a long time, but let, let's start with some introductions. Maybe, Lewis, can you uh, just share a little bit about, you know, who you are and your journey into the land of crypto? Sure. Yeah. Uh, glad to be here, Brian. And um, so I, I got into I got into crypto um, after the subprime crisis um, got started and kind of like hit Spain, where I'm from. And so I discovered Bitcoin. Um, in the beginning, I thought it was a scam, but then like the kind of like the whole crisis and, and how things shape around banks um, kind of changed my view around it. And I use it as like this amazing tool, software tool for human liberation. So I kind of like got into it um, with the hope that I would, you know. Uh, one day remove the need for banks in the first place and all the power they have. Um, and then I found a couple of companies in the in the space. And then eventually in, in 2016, uh, I, I thought kind of like the next step after Bitcoin and after, which is permissionless money, after Ethereum, which is kind of like um, this is smart contract uh, platform that enables to, to build so many organizations. The next step is to actually build those organizations. And so I started Aragon um, and Aragon took DAOs from basically zero dollars in AUM to the first billion. Uh, and it still powers some heavyweights like Core Finance or, or Lido uh, today on, on Ethereum. And and yeah, and then, I mean, after that, it was kind of like Bitcoin, Ethereum, then Aragon for, for DAOs. And then the next steps is like, uh, you know, what is the best application for DAOs that can possibly exist? And that is, well, that is replacing the nation state. Um, and so that's why uh, that's why I'm working on, on Nation 3 now. Cool. And then what about you, Anastasia? Great to be here, Brian. Thank you so much for, for having us. So I actually come into the crypto world from the VC side. I uh, was in a couple of different funds like OpenOcean and Firestarter before I co-founded Fabric together with my, my colleagues, Richard and Max. And it was one of the earliest funds in Europe investing in, in the Web3 universe back before it was even, it had a, a name like that. Um, but for me, I, I come from Crimea and I've kind of personally seen a lot of things that are broken with nation states and a lot of unfairness and, and how that affects people um, at the level of, um, of ordinary citizens. And so for me, the, um, the innovation and the, the tech stack that crypto brings has always been um, directed towards that. Like the core goal and the main um, driver is that we need to be able to uh, recreate and, and re um, envision the way that nation states work so that ultimately we can make lives better and, and higher quality for, for people. So that's, that's something that has been driving me personally. And um, and focusing on Nation3 um, made it kind of a little bit more formal in that sense. 
Cool. Then let's let's uh, start with the Nation Three. What's Nation Three, and what's the what's the problem that Nation Three is trying to solve? Yeah. So Nation Three, it's a, it's a sovereign nation state on the cloud, um, and so we're trying to build this. We're trying to build um, basically a state that has a jurisdiction that is its own jurisdiction, uh, its own system of law, which is kind of a requirement to have jurisdiction. Um, and then we're also building a, a court system. Um, because a court is required to enforce uh, the law, right? And to create this such uh, jurisdiction. And so if you think about it, um, you have for a smart contract, you have Ethereum, which is this kind of like jurisdiction for code. And that covers a bunch of use cases. Um, and then DeFi emerge, and we kind of like managed to get away from the financial, traditional financial system. But then when you think about the legal system, uh, there is no such thing that enables us to like decouple from existing uh, traditional institutions that are corrupt, slow, inefficient, and, and all of that. And so um, when Nation 3, we're kind of like creating that like internet native jurisdiction and system of law where you can you can come in and you can uh, create an agreement with someone else um, and you can transact without the need of like having this like fair entity that is like a traditional nation state with all of the problems they, they carry. Um, and, and the way to do that, the way to create such a system of law uh, and jurisdiction is to actually start a nation state but on the cloud. And so the idea is to first kind of like create this internal economy, um, gather the citizen base uh, and create a strong system of law. And then of course, after that, like, you know, uh, down the road, it's very interesting to explore um, getting land and like establishing kind of like uh, special economic areas in different parts of the world. And then eventually, you know, uh, down the road, you can basically start experimenting with nation states at the speed that we experiment with software. Um, and then finally reimagine what these institutions that have been there for like hundreds or thousands of years and they are so obsolete can do for us instead of what we can do for them, which is kind of like how it is today. One thing that sort of like stands out to me when you say this, uh, you know, you say like a new legal system, uh, you know, that's like in the cloud. But of course, if you think of the existing legal system, then it seems like a huge amount of the power it has is through the enforcement of, you know, this police that's like shows up at your door with a gun and like arrests you or like puts you in jail or like they have all these kind of like means of enforcing power. And of course, we've already had in a way types of like contract in crypto, right, through smart contracts, which just tend to be, you know, enforced automatically by mostly having some collateral put up and then it gets maybe allocated in some way, depending on some events. Uh, so I'm curious, like, w w what does such a legal system look like? Is, is, can you have a legal system without the kind of police enforcement? You definitely can. Um, the difference is what you can enforce and you cannot, right? Like in 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 the system we're creating, you can um, you can enforce the slashing of some balances, right? So when people enter an agreement, they set the maximum amount of like um, basically collateral or stake they can lose if they misbehave, and then the court can like rule to change those balances and basically like you know um, uh, like remove some of the collateral from someone who misbehaved. You cannot send someone to jail. You don't have like physical authority over them, but you have financial authority over them. And um, what we are realizing is that most of the time, financial authority is fine. Um, obviously, this wouldn't work for for big crimes, um, and, and I don't think like a cloud nation could like rule over certain things that are physical, of course. But you can rule over everything that is internet based. Um, and you know, if you look at the GDP uh, of the internet, it's like the largest GDP in the world by a large extent. So. We think that this is a very good step in rebuilding the, the fabric of our society. And I think also just to, to jump into this, like you highlighted, Brian, that, you know, the traditional nation states, they've been uh, militarized and kind of based on this idea of physical violence for a very long time. And, and those pillars of, of nation states have existed for, for thousands of years. And the reason they exist that way is because back in the day when we operated as tribes, we really needed these kind of notions of patriotism and war and, and sacrifice and all of that stuff to survive. And the, um, the governments haven't really changed their structure since then. It's, it's kind of like this whole Machiavellian thing of, you know, the princes or the, the, the political parties that own the, the power. They want to make sure that people are dependent on them for protection, right? Because they control the police, they control the military, and, and people in theory rely 
on that type of law enforcement for, for protection. And so people are willing to um, give up their rights, their freedoms in order to be protected. And this whole narrative that, that you need this, um, this protection is just so flawed. Like we don't really need this in today's age. We could completely rebuild the structures from being um, driven by this militarized uh, narrative towards something that's economic, right? As Louis mentioned, you don't need to be able to send people to jail to prevent them from committing crimes. You can slash them economically. And frankly, same applies on a state level. Um, we're today at a, at a brink of a nuclear disaster in the world, and that shouldn't really be happening, right? Like, if we are, we are much more advanced species than that. Like, how primitive is it that there's a maniac somewhere in a bunker with a nuclear button that can just press it anytime whenever he feels um, tired of the, of the war? It's just insane, right? In, instead of it, we could have states that are operated uh, based on smart contracts and economic incentives where... If something goes wrong and if one state is trying to prevent another from behaving maliciously, you can perhaps deploy a smart contract that erases the treasury of that state. And so you have like some kind of um, mutual deterrence based on those economic um, powers and not on physically destroying the planet that we're living in and the lives of people and all of that. It's just insane to me to think that in, in 21st century, that is what we have. Maybe that's a, a good a good sort of segue into going a little bit more de detail in, you know, what are the difference between nation three or maybe other types of cloud nations that people are going to create and traditional nations the way we know them today? Like what are the most important dimensions in which they differ? So I would say one of the core um, starting points to differentiate them is the pillars on which the nation state is built. So as mentioned, the traditional nation state, they're typically um, operated on, um, on principles of war, sacrifice, pride, uh, and nationalism that is defined by territories, where if you're born in a certain territory, you are presumed to have a, a cultural belonging to that nation, and you're expected to defend it with your life, uh, and all these completely weird things that, that people um, are supposed to experience, while on that level, Nation 3 is, is arguing that you can have the sense of belonging and the sense of community based on uh, principles that you choose, for example, on, on certain shared values, on things that you want to see in your community, whether it's um, nomadic living or whether it's maybe eco-friendly stuff, it can be values that you choose and that you identify yourself with that you can build a community around. It doesn't have to be um, based on territory that you were born in and then the passport that you happen to hold. So that's one thing. The other major thing is ability to exit um, is very different. I think as you're building um, these digital nations and um, network states, as Balaji has coined um, the, the term for them, the ability to exit is super important. So you can actually enter and exit communities and, um, and therefore the underlying services based on what you need in the moment, what um, stage in life you are in. For example, maybe when you're younger, you want to be part of a, a nomad community. And so you identify more with a nation state that is focused on that, on nomadic living and the services that are powering that kind of economy. But then maybe as you turn uh, older and you're starting to have a family, maybe you're focusing on more... Um, family-friendly stuff and, and settling down somewhere and, and you suddenly care about eco-friendly living and, and kids' kindergartens or whatever, right? And so you can you can enter and exit as you will um, without the restraints and the, the difficulties that current nation states um, try to enforce. Like in, in some countries, you literally almost cannot lose your citizenship, uh, even if you want to do. In some others, to get it, you have to prove your loyalty for years and years by, by paying taxes and, and, and not leaving the country for more than X amount of days a year and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but most importantly, it, it's the way the services are provided. Today, I think most nation states have a monopoly over pretty much everything they do. And they, they provide their services in a way where um, they don't really respect the free market, right? They, they provide services where um, they kind of treat their citizens not as users, but as someone who owes them something. And they're kind of like, all right, we're going to give you the basics just so you can stay here and survive and pay taxes. But you're not really our customer and you don't really have much say over um, improving the services or, or what's going to happen or who's going to 
perhaps build a competing service or anything like that. And I think that's the biggest flaw, which Nation3 uh, is trying to fix, right? What we're trying to create is a very thin layer of um, state-funded services, if you will, such as the Nation3 court, which is kind of the most important piece of the infrastructure to power the entire economy, uh, because you need to secure it with a system of law. And then the idea is that you give a way for the open market to then create services and compete with each other that people can benefit from. And so that openness and that idea of competition, healthy competition, and uh, and truly respecting the free market, I think is going to be a, a pretty paramount difference. Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the striking things sort of about a lot of countries today, maybe not all of them. I, th I think there's like some differences to degree of which, but this kind of way of, of treating their citizens basically as like a, you know, cash generating assets, right? And then, and then of course you have, I think for example, the US is interesting in that regard, right? Basically like taxing people regardless of where they are, right? Even if they're not in the US, not using the US infrastructure or this concept of an exit tax also, right? If you give up the citizenship, well, then you have to basically buy your way out of it. And I think that's like, yeah, the US has that, but that's been not, not that uncommon. The Germany has something like that. And, and I, I would actually think that it's probably, if, 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 if there's more power shifting away to, you know, crypto, to the internet, and, and they kind of, they're going to be even more aggressive, right? Than trying to exert like the most they can from whoever they can sort of control. Yeah, I mean, it, it, well, that is why right now is kind of like the best time to get it started. Um, because in like five, 10 years down the road, uh, there are going to be two kinds of states. The ones that are the ones that are super unfriendly to this trend and kind of like try to pose and, uh, you know, taxes are going to be through the roof. I mean, taxes are really high uh, in a lot of societies. And then when you have boomers that are retiring, in the West, um, in this like inverted like uh, population pyramid, and all of that coupled with like all of the you know exodus of of talent that is going to other friendly countries, and also use the exodus of uh, of assets towards the internet economy, they have two options: they can either be friendly to this trend, or they can increase taxes. Um, and if they do that, then the economy is just gonna set up a spiral. Like everyone who wants to produce and do something valuable is gonna exit the country. Um, and so there are going to be, I think, more and more countries that are going to be friendly to like establishing special economic zones, for example, um, and even welcoming cloud nations into their land, right, um, to kind of like make them prosperous again. And so I think it's definitely the right timing. Um, five, ten years from now, I will be surprised if there is no uh, nation state, for example, in Southern Europe that is on the brink of a bailout. So you mentioned like services a bit, right? So one thing that we talked about a little bit was this idea of like a court system. What, what else do you think are like the, the core services that Nation3 wants to provide? Um, so one thing we've been exploring lately is, is UBI. Um, it's something that's been, I guess, around and spoken, spoken about for, for some time, but no one really has done it successfully. And, and I think it's something super critical to ensure that every human being can have a, a quality of life that, that they deserve without really having any dependency on, on anything. But the way you do it doesn't have to be parasitic or it doesn't have to be such that encourages people to, to not do anything. There's um, certain checks and balances that you can implement to make sure that it, um, at the end of the day, it actually fuels the economy rather than stagnating it. So we're, we're researching and exploring uh, this concept of UBI and Kind of coupled with the nation three core, there might be some ways where it could be implemented in such a way where it's more of a teach a man how to fish rather than um, just give a man a fish for a day kind of thing. Um, Louis, I'm stealing words from your mouth. It was actually something that you came up with as a concept, so you can uh, so credit to you there. But um, I really love that phrase, and it's just you know the the idea that if um, you distribute UBI not necessarily in the form of just money that can be spent, but rather um, in the case of Nation 3 and its court in the form of a um, kind of power that they have to enter agreements, right? Effectively in the form of collateral that they're free to use to enter into mutual agreements and therefore participate in the economy, that becomes very interesting because now you're enabling people who would have otherwise been left out of the economy to participate in the economy and that just fuels the growth further and, and that makes them, makes them active, that makes them 
capable of making more money, et cetera, et cetera. It's just one of the ways to do it. Um, other ways, of course, could be distributing just you know pure stable coins or whatever. So we're exploring different ways, but UBI could be, I think, a very interesting um, public good that we could use. Um, otherwise, like some stuff that is interesting is, for example, um, insurance circles for income variability. So, you know, enabling people that are nation three citizens to form these circles and protect each other from having uh, less income in one month than in another month where uh, it, it's effectively like mutuals, right? And they can take out uh, money from that common pocket if they, if they need to. This is interesting as well. So some of the services, what we're thinking of as um, public goods and something that needs to be provided at a, at a nation three level, but then a large amount of services will likely uh, try to fund and encourage other people to build in, in the open market and just, you know, compete with each other and, and try to provide whatever is best um, and whatever people choose to use. I guess the, the UBI thing for me kind of like brings up an, an, like, an like a very interesting question here. I mean, one, one of the uh, things that may, uh, you know, was mentioned in this deck uh, I saw about Nation 3 is this, okay, it's a zero tax nation. Now, of course, there are some countries, like I think very, very few countries that don't have taxes. I guess the UAE, like Dubai and stuff is the one that comes to mind. I'm not sure if there are others that are basically no, no I think maybe there are some others, uh, but there were very few. And, and in general, countries and nation states have relied on taxation, right? And I guess there's many different types of taxation, you know, taxation of corporate entities, corporate taxes, things like, you know, income tax, things like uh, kind of VAT, you know, where you basically consumption tax. And then there's like, you know, I'm sure like a hundred other smaller taxes that, uh, you know, they come up with over time. So I'm curious, why no taxes do you, do you think, I mean, first of all, yeah, why no taxes? Do you think this is like uh, just the beginning and maybe at a later point, if there's like physical land taxes that do make sense? Uh, and how, where do the revenues come from for Nation 3? Yeah, it's a good question. So we came at this with a very kind of like clean mind. Um, like I had previously lived in, in Switzerland um, and they have very few taxes. And the ones that, for example, they have the wealth tax uh, and it's, it's quite, quite low. Um, and for example, like, you know, of all the taxes, if you think about what a nation state does, um, like to a large extent, it does protect private property and uh, allow this like, free market to, to thrive. And so the more assets you have, you could argue that the more um, security you need for your assets. And so therefore there's like an argument for wealth tax being a legitimate tax. Um, and as a, as a resident in Switzerland, I was kind of like, okay, cool. Um, so it's not that I radically oppose any kind of tax, but then when looking at, at the problem, um, we kind of like just realized that we don't need them um, if you start with a blank slate and using crypto economics. And so Nation3 has its own token, which is Nation, um, and it's kind of like a community currency. And then um, people kind of stake Nation to become citizens, um, and, then, and then it's when they have rights. Um, and, and they can participate in the system and, and govern it. And we kind of thought that, you know, the, the nation through DAO owns a big chunk of the nation supply um, since the beginning. And so if there is demand for becoming a citizen, and then uh, even within that like kind of like internal economy, there are other services that also require nation to be locked, then over time there is increasing demand uh, and there is, you know, kind of like the same supply. Um, and so, and so that would basically allow it out to finance itself, uh, through this value accrual and then further pay for building more services and enhancing the common goods, which would then again, um, can generate more demand for becoming citizen, generate more demand for using the services like the, like interacting in the jurisdiction and, and using the court. And so in that circle, just start very quickly realizing that it's actually positive for the, for the nation state because it can finance itself but also for the citizens. Because when they are locking nation, it's not that they are losing it. It's not that they are sending it to anyone. They are locking it for X amount of time, right? And so at the end of the day, it's still their 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 wealth that they have, uh, just to have it in this token that is locked. So you are you are not like, quote unquote, stealing anyone. 
Um, and you're also not like making the economy slower because nation states are usually quite bad allocators, um, like asset allocators. So usually the, the more they take from the economy to like handle themselves, the worst. And so you want to not leave, you know, citizens to, to kind of like have their wealth and allocate it privately as they, as they will, and uh, to kind of like kickstart the economy. And so what I'm trying to say here is as a citizen in nation three today, you have to lock your, your nation. Um, and then if everything goes, goes well and you do kind of like work, um, governance work and, and, and interact in the jurisdiction and things are well, you actually do well as well. Um, you have, you can even earn money, uh, kind of like by being a citizen, obviously depending on a bunch of factors, but, uh, what I'm trying to say here is it's kind of like the opposite to what you have to do today. Being a citizen implies that you are, you're paying someone, um, here implies that you are kind of like owning something, uh, and you're owning something that allows you to govern it. Um, and then if you do things well and you govern things well, then it even pays you back. Um, and in principle, that's work It's still, they are not set in stone, but in principle, we don't see the need for taxes now. Okay, but like right now, for example, how much, uh, what kind of is the monetary value of the nation tokens that one has to lock up to become a citizen? So right now, uh, in dollar terms, it's around 1.4k dollars. Uh, it used to be obviously way higher in, 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 the, in the bull run. Um, and so we kind of think that in the beginning, you know, we want people that are obviously long term aligned. So it's important for, for them to own nation and to have it locked. But obviously, you know, over time, um, we will hope to introduce kind of like newer kinds of passports in which people can earn their way um, to become citizens and not only have like a financial or need a financial stake in the beginning. Because that's just like the, the economics here seem to be like, I'm struggling to see how that adds up, no, because it's not, it's not, I mean, I guess it's sort of, Let's say now somebody right locks up one point four thousand dollars worth of nation tokens and becomes a citizen, and then they can you know enjoy all these public goods that Nation Three produces, like forever. I, I I get that there's maybe it has like some positive impact on the nation price because they okay they first have to buy one point four k of the tokens and it increases a bit the treasury value, but. It, it doesn't seem like you'd be able to produce a sort of income stream from this that would be, you know, sufficient to produce, uh, you, you know, to, to do things in a kind of, in a more, on a more substantial scale. Does that make sense? Or? So ju just to, I guess, clarify a little bit, it wouldn't be financed simply through the, uh, the citizenship, right? So you can think of citizenship as a membership, right? So membership is what gives you access to certain services. It isn't uh, the entire thing. So once you become a citizen, and indeed you're required to, to buy the tokens and then lock them up, which takes them out of circulation and already adds a little bit towards the, the value accrual. But now, for example, the, the core service, really, the most important sort of thin layer that Nation3 is building, the court, um, and the, the heart of the court is the... Um, is the stake that you need to put up in order to be able to participate in agreements, right? So here, if you think of it, we are our hypothesis is that um, the court will be the um, economic engine for Nation Three in the sense that, um, you know, just like Singapore, for example, based itself on becoming the hub for economic activity by providing services that are high quality, low cost, and and very secure. Same way, Nation3 is aiming to become a hub for economic activity for internet users, for crypto users, where uh, what you can do is you can get Nation, you can lock it up in agreements. So let's say if you want to um, get a, a, an audit for whatever you're building, right? And I'm an auditor and we want to enter into a contract with each other. Right now, there's no such way to do so in, in Web3 in a secure way, unless you use an, a physical jurisdiction somewhere. What you can do with Nation3 is you can put collateral. Currently, that is uh, planned to be in, in Nation3, so in the Nation3 token. And you put up that collateral, you lock it up, again, for the duration of the, um, of the contract. And you're then able to, to enter into the agreement, and, and if no contract is disputed, then you get it back. If it's disputed, then um, then you can get slashed. So what, what we mean by that is that the more economic activity happens within Nation 3, the more tokens will be locked in the contracts. 
And, and that's another push for, for value accrual. And as we create more services like the court, um, the idea is that you're able to capitalize the, um, the economy, capitalize the, the state by providing high quality services that require a financial stake for participation. And, and then that stake by being locked capitalizes the treasury further. It's a hypothesis. It's, it may well be that as we start testing it out, something needs to be tweaked. Obviously, we're super early and we're very open to, to tweaking it as we go. But, you know, at least at the scale that we are exploring it right now, it does seem to, to work. But let's see. It's indeed optimistic. Yeah, yeah I mean, like right now, the, uh, most of the supply, uh, nation supply is actually locked. And then also like treasury is around 25 to 30 million dollars, treasury of the doubt. So, so far at this particular point in time, yeah, since we work in a sense, as I was saying, um, but yeah, let's see over time. I mean, gotta keep a flexible mind. So this core system then basically also enables people to do kind of transactions that are, yeah, you mentioned this auditing thing, right? Where basically there is a degree of trust, right? It's more similar to the kind of traditional contracts, right? People create about, oh, I'm going to provide the service to you and then some service provided. And it's not like totally, you know, a smart contract can't verify easily if the service has been provided or not. So I'm, I'm curious here, is this something in the example before, right? Let's say we have one party that's the auditor and, you know, I want to buy some service from the auditor. Would we then both need to be a nation three citizen to be able to use nation three courts? Or is that kind of something that, you know, maybe just one would uh, need to be, or, or maybe neither. And we just have to lock up nations to use the court system. I'm glad you actually asked that. It's a, it's a super interesting question that we just last week had a, an Agora on Agora is a, is a new theme of um, kind of internal sort of borderline philosophic discussion topics that we're doing um, to kind of like debate and discuss what makes sense uh, as we move forward. And, and it's interesting. So we're, we're exploring a few routes here because on one hand, um, there's no reason why you couldn't have a distinction between, let's say, nation three citizens and something like residents or, uh, or tourists or whatever, people who are able to use the particular service without having to subscribe for the whole thing, right? So there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to, to do that. So we are exploring a way where indeed to make it super smooth, super easy, um, and people can use just the court, for example, without having to be nation three citizens. And, and they just need to look up whatever nation is needed for, for the use of the court and for the scale of their particular agreement. If the, if the agreement is very small, then obviously the, the stake would be corresponding. So it's, it's an option and it's something that our, our citizens are discussing now. Um, but I think it would potentially make sense to, to make it simpler and, and kind of remove the hurdle of, of needing to become a, um, a citizen for it. And then as we go forward, we'll see it. It depends on, you know, which service is it. It depends on um, on a lot of things. But again, you can compare it probably with fairly successful countries like Singapore. You don't necessarily need to be a citizen of Singapore uh, to be able to use some of the services that it provides and headquarter in your company there or, or doing business uh, with the backing of Singapore. You can do that by just you know establishing your entity there right and so in the long term i think what nation tree could do is is be something like that for the internet users where let's say you're a member of another DAO, let's say you're a bankless DAO member and and you are working on a new project and and you want to build your guild around it and you need some um you know way of distributing the salaries to that guild and someone needs to operate that or, or whatever and and you can just you know use the nation three court services in order to be able to execute whatever it is that you're doing, um, which I think would be pretty powerful. And so far from discussing it with other DAOs and other projects, it's something that uh, feels in, in super high demand because it just doesn't exist as of yet. So you mentioned before, you know, this idea of nation three as you know something that's connected through you know, the sense of belonging or, you know, based on like shared values and goals, something like that, right? Where, whereas traditional nations, you have, you know, 
maybe the you know where you're born and th- and this deep cultural connection and language and 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 maybe genetics and heritage and like a lot of other things that connected now mm, i'm just wondering like if you're if if it's basically possible you know like for anyone to like buy nation three citizenship how doesn't that go sort of against this idea of creating you know, having a foundation on, on shared values? Because, like, how do you know if people share those values if they're just buying the citizenship or, or buying or, like, locking some some monetary asset to get it? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a really good concern. I think being very early here helps a lot. Like, you think about people that bought Bitcoin uh, very early or, or if they were very idolically um, aligned. Like I remember the Ethereum community in 2015 and it was even super different to what it is now. Um, and so right now we're kind of like relying on that. Like people that are into network states today are quite a niche. And so they are all quite like, you know, libertarian. Um, some have had like personal experiences, like bad personal experiences with nation states. Some are just like completely sad and, and fed up of the macro environment that we have today. And so I think relying on that so far makes sense. Um, of course, over time, maybe there's something else that needs to be done, uh, some sort of like interview process or something like that. But also one thing that we want to, to ensure is um, we want to ensure that, you know, uh, pseudonymous or anonymous people can, can also join because we have um, a few contributors that are, that are anonymous. And we think that if you start something like this from scratch, it needs to be like, a, you know, um, privacy needs to be something deeply respected. And so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll navigate that, but so far, so good. And and I think it's just worth mentioning, you know, indeed, for for right now, it's still so niche that everyone who is becoming a citizen clearly believes in the same values. They believe in the solar punk future that we're all trying to build and, and they all subscribe to it and, and it's great. But as we go forward, I also imagine um, smaller sub-communities being built, right? And and creating their kind of micro-nations, m- maybe, um, and, and maybe using the, the wider area of services that Nation 3 as a whole provides. Uh, let's say if you're building a like a physical community somewhere, uh, a city, and perhaps you have, or, or maybe even smaller than a city, maybe you're building kind of like a, a condominium of sorts or, or a, um, you know, a, a space with, you know, 20 houses and you're building your community there. And that's where you might want to have some interview process where you want to ensure that people are super aligned and subscribing to the same values, but that might be done at a more granular level uh, further down the line. So we'll see how, how things progress. So let, let's talk a bit about governance, right? So, I mean, democracy is something that has, I think, become more questioned, right? In the last years, you know, you've seen like people like Trump get elected or Bolsonaro or like lots of people that, you know, seem kind of, uh, you know, not so sane or, or you may be unethical people or they're lying a lot and still they get elected, right? And And so... I think that has definitely undermined a little bit the sort of conviction that, you know, democracy is like a well-functioning way for large groups of humans to coordinate and make decisions. So I'm curious how you see that in Nation 3. How are people going to, how are decisions happening today? And how do you see that evolve as Nation 3 potentially, you know, scales and gets to like significant numbers of people? It's a very important point. Like, if you think about providing a system of law in a jurisdiction, the very, uh, the very basic thing you need to get right is your own governance, um, because your own governance can then change laws, and then uh, can basically, like, you know, if, if things are not well, well done, it can destroy such jurisdiction. And so, the governance system it's really important. The checks and balances inside the governance system are even more important um, because the checks and balances ensure that over time, if there are turbulent times in which some, um, you know. Some people leverage um, the weakness of the of the times. For example, you know, Trump winning the elections uh, le- was leveraging certain certain weaknesses that the U.S. was suffering, um, both culturally and economically, and so forth. And so, when those things happen, um, you have to have some governance process that is strong enough and with checks and balances to make sure that you can course correct uh, and kind of like even improve the system far- from there. Um, and so, for us, governance is something that we're taking very seriously. Um, obviously, from my experience at Aragon, I learned a lot about how to govern DAOs. 
And we kind of like rebuilt this governance process from scratch in which uh, it's around the whole proposal process, like what is the governance proposal? Um, what does it entail? We also built some tools to make sure that all governance proposals adhere to a specification that actually is written in code. So like you have your most subjectivity from the governance process as much as possible and improve understability. Um, mostly because I've also seen in DAOs that there's so much subjectivity and so many people working, working, uh, talking more than working really, like just writing and writing and writing, but like not really doing things. And so we're trying to stay away from that and kind of like encourage builders. Uh, and so keep a governance process that is simple and is predictable and attracts people that want to actually get things done and not just talk about how to get things done um, or like drown in, in bureaucracy. And so we've been kind of like just building uh, all of that governance process. And, and today how it works, I mean, in a nutshell, Basically, you have citizens. Citizens can uh, can make governance proposals, um, and then it goes through multiple stages, kind of like uh, until the proposal is frozen. And then after it's frozen, you can go to a snapshot vote, um, and then citizens vote. Right now, it's uh, it's uh, token weighted, so it's only citizens that can vote that have the NFT. But then it's token weighted to their uh, to their uh, nation stake that they have locked. And here, you know, let's see how it goes over time. Um, it's kind of like a good enough compromise between one person, one vote, and, and just token weighted. Um, because right now, NFTs are, are non-transferable. And so only externally owned accounts can, can have them. So we kind of have a good sense that each passport corresponds to at least a person. Um, and so we can't really have that system now because it is true that democracy has been quite... Wait, wait how do you know each passport corresponds to a person? Well, I said that we kind of have like an understanding, like we are not sure, but like uh, we are sure that there's no smart contract that owns, because, uh, you know, uh, we're using the V token system. Um, so we have V nation that needs to be locked uh, in order to, to get a passport. And so smart contracts cannot own it. So at least from that perspective, we kind of have like a good sense that it's people who are owning them and not like smart contracts or institutions or, or pools or whatever. And then they are non-transferable. So it's not like people can like buy them and then speculate with them. Um, so, so far that's been working, uh, but it's going to be quite a challenge because um, it is clear that one person, one vote is not working very well at the macro scale. So we might need to move away from that only. Maybe it's like a good check some, check some, uh, check and balance, kind of like maybe you can have a, a system in which you have both financial interest at heart and kind of like token weighted, but then also like one person, one vote, um, that needs to like ratify it. Like it is still kind of like a, a thing that we are working on and, and seen that we're mostly focusing on the governance process itself like how do decisions get made how do you track them um and then what do you need to do in order to improve the system itself and the checks and balances around it what are your biggest learnings from aragon that have kind of shaped the way you're approaching this i mean one of them and probably the first one actually is that DAOs are super chaotic and dysfunctional today um, and I realized that, like, you know, once uh, once we started Aragon, um, we saw very clearly that there was no, not a lot of, like, a strong demand for DAOs in 2016, 2017, 2018. But then 2019, and kind of, like, up until now, it's been, it's been growing. Um, and the last year has been massive for DAOs. But they are so chaotic and so disorganized. And most of them are not really decentralized. Um, they are not really organized either, and let, let alone autonomous. And so... One of the learnings has been, all right, focus on getting things done. Um, a lot of DAOs out there just end up being sort of like worker unions in which people slowly deplete the treasury without really doing any work. So like really focusing on keeping the governance process not bureaucratic, um, but actually kind of like focus on builders and attracting builders has been a very important learning. And then within that, there is, of course, making proposals very objective and actionable and not subjective and creating a process that encourages that. Uh, to remove kind of like side effects because we have we have a lot of this at aragon we kind of like started our own governance process for the dragon network DAO, and then people made proposals and then there were once they passed there were a bunch of side effects because uh, it was a blob of text um and proposals shouldn't really be that this should be almost like code like all right what does it actually do on chain and so so yeah that's been a really big learning um and and then another big learning has been that like governance tooling today is so um 
kind of like fragmented that you have to be okay with it. You have to be okay with the fact that you're going to use like many, many tools and governance is not only the place in which you vote, it's the place in which you start discussing. And then obviously how you enact your own chain, but just like a wide range of tools. Cool. Well, maybe let's talk about the question of land. So when, when will it make sense? So when do you think it will be the time for Nation 3 to like acquire land? And how could you see that? What would this look like? So one of the big issues we're seeing with some of the attempts at building a, a network state or a cloud nation out there is that they try to get land or into the land space a little bit too early. And we're trying to avoid that. Because the minute you enter into the, uh, the land territory, you're starting to encounter so many issues from a legal regulatory perspective. You start clashing with the parent state directly and, and all of that. So you need to be really ready for that stage before you enter it. So the way we're trying to approach it is, you know, step one, build a functioning legal system, right? And, and the system of law um, that, that governs it. Super important um, to have the governance system right so that people can... Um, make decisions in an informed way, in a super clear way, not get stuck in democracy, everything that Louis mentioned. Um, now, with both of these things, build a, a strong economy, right? And, and build a strong treasury. That one literally cannot stress how important it is to have that before you enter into the land space. Because if you're starting to um, challenge the traditional state system without having a critical mass of both funding and people, you're screwed, right? And so for us, having these two as the, um, I guess, numeric signal is, is super important. So, you know, as soon as we feel like we have the treasury that is um, competitive with an average EU nation state, for example, um, as soon as we have the, the population that is also sizable enough that, you know, once you enter, people on the international scale or the states on the international scale, they, um, they kind of have to take you seriously. They don't really have another choice, right? Like if you have large population, uh, a large treasury and you have a functioning legal system and functioning process, the very least they have to do is to deal with you as an opponent, right? And so that's something that we are getting ourselves ready for. Um, but then our position is not to actually challenge um, any state head on, but try to find the ones that are willing to partner and willing to provide the space and the land for special economic zones and for uh, cloud nations just because they are understanding that they need to survive, right? And, and there's already a few of them in Europe, even, that we have spoken to that have, you know, incredible natural resources, beautiful, amazing spaces. And they're just realizing that they're kind of at the brink of uh, dying out if they don't do anything about it. And so they're, they're starting to kind of get comfortable with the idea that they might need to partner with these more technically advanced communities and, and, um, and cloud nations. And so our hope is that more and more of these will emerge and we're going to make sure that we have our foot in the door and we already do by, by having these conversations to, to you know, effectively base ourselves in one of these special economic zones where we have a, a blank slate for taxation and for a bunch of other things. Um, and, and of course, we will make sure that on the legal front, um, you know, Nation 3 is compliant with the international law in the sense of the most basic things like... Um, you know, criminal activity and everything like that is, is obviously pretty important to give people um, peace of mind. And also one, one thing that we've been focusing on in kind of like the system of law, it's uh, when you talk to a traditional jurisdiction about creating a special economic area, having like a lot of flexibility around, around laws, it is very important that you have proven yourself before, right? So um, if you are a cloud nation, um, like, like we are, focusing on that like very core layer of uh, jurisdiction and creating a system of law, it's so important because then you prove yourself as, you know, as a community that is able to run uh, itself in a legal way. And then transitioning that into, into mid space, you know, makes sense. It's way easier and way better than just getting a community that has no experience whatsoever in doing so. So in, in, in Balaji's book, he, he, he talked there about this idea of having called it as an archipelago basically like a sort of you know amalgamation of like many different like pieces of land across the world do you have an opinion on that do you think it will make more sense to have you know kind of one 
special economic zone somewhere where you build something up or do you think this idea of like just basically buying a bunch of land in like different places uh does that make sense to you and definitely having multiple special economic areas that are widespread across the globe makes a lot of sense um decentralization right you know they can they can destroy a node but they cannot destroy them all at the same time so it's kind of like the same principle applied to a nation state it would make wars um, way harder and less profitable. And I guess what we mean by establishing in the first place in some special economic zones is just starting small and experimenting in, in one piece of land first before you start building out that archipelago of, um, of territories across the world. So I think you used the, the word sovereign, uh, sovereign before. What's what does sovereign mean in your eyes? Like, how would you define it? Well, it's it's fully independent, right? It doesn't depend on on any other entity that can like control it or or be above it. Uh, and so, the reason nation three it's it's sovereign um, and kind of like it's a sovereign nation is because no other nation has authority to to shut it down. Um, like the the nation three DAO is in Ethereum. And, and, and there is no, nation states do not have jurisdiction per se over Ethereum. Um, although the U.S. says that um, there are Ethereum nodes in the U.S., therefore Ethereum is just in the U.S., um, we, we don't believe that that's the case. Um, and so if you run on the internet um, as your kind of like jurisdiction um, for code, then as a DAO, you can be your own sovereign entity. And, and based on that, we believe that nation three is a sovereign nation state. And do you think like recognition from existing nation states uh, is that important, or what role does that play? In my opinion, and maybe it's not the, mo the most widespread opinion, but in my opinion, it shouldn't really matter. Um, if you are if you are trying the incumbents to to recognize you, you are playing the wrong game. Like the what we're building here is something new, right? It's something that um, some of them might like, some of them might not, but um, at large, it will replace them. And so it, it is very hard to, you know, it's, it's kind of like saying that as an automobile maker, you need recognition from the horse carriage industry to, to sell cars, right? Like you just don't, you just focus on making a car that works fast and people will use it, right? So we're trying to do the same here. And uh... Maybe one thing we could also talk about is a little bit on, I mean, we talked a lot about, you know, the concept, the way of organizing it, the way of structuring it. And of course, those are in, in essence, really the core questions here. But I'm curious also about the technology. Like what does the Nation3 tech stack look like? Yeah, so right now we have a couple, a couple apps. Um, like the what is nation three like in itself um today we have the the service for for governance which is the sense can engage we have the also the passport issuance and then we have the court that we're working on and there has been a, a first um governance proposal for a for a ubi system so th those are kind of the pieces that we are building now um there's of course kind of like a larger stack that needs to be built and that we're not gonna um build alone um, and i think i can talk a bit more about the kind of like stack if you want yeah, definitely. We actually have something that um, maybe your listeners can can take a look at. It's um it's a tech tree that we built, which is kind of our vision of the of the nation three stack um, as it needs to be built out over time to achieve the the fully functioning, super prosperous solar punk state that we want in the in the end of the day. And our vision for it, and actually how the whole idea of a nation three nation three started in the first place, is that you do that by investing in the in the capable teams that help build it out and, and kind of creating a nation three VC effectively. So it's sort of how the idea of a nation three as a, as a cloud nation was born in the first place. First, we, we thought that, hey, this clearly needs to exist. Um, so why don't we start a VC fund to, to back teams and, um, and projects that are building the infrastructure pieces and the, the tech stack to enable that to happen. And, and that we realized that um, there isn't a better way to do so than kind of dog fooding these products for something you're building yourself, right? And so it makes sense that building a community around it and trying to build an attempt at creating a nation state um, makes makes sense. And then as you do that and you realize what infrastructure pieces are missing, 
what pieces of the tech stack are are needed, then you can establish a VC fund, which we're still intending to do if the community decides that it's a worthwhile activity. And, and, you know, same as the kind of app store model, instead of having to do everything, all of the apps, all of the services yourself, you, you allow for people to create them in the open market, but you, you back them. Basically, you select the, the ones that you believe in the most and you select the, um, the most capable teams and you try to advance it forward. I think it's way better than doing grants system. I personally don't believe in, in that much just because I think people um, use much less um, kind of like selection and less care when they pick teams to give grants to than when it's a VC model because you're much more invested into it and and it works better. Um, so so that's something that we are we're exploring, and and hopefully uh, you know engaging a wider community into building these things will will bring this future much faster. So so yeah, I would encourage all the listeners to to check out the um, the the tech tree it's on the website, and if there's anything that they want to build from that please definitely reach out. Cool, maybe, so what's, what do you see as the, the roadmap? Like how, if, if things, if everything goes well, what do the next, you know, five years look like for Nation3? Yeah, so I mean, right now we're focused on the, on the jurisdiction, right? So building the very core components of the jurisdiction um, and having something that works will happen very, very fast. Like we're, we're targeting you next month to release the first version of the court. And start testing it out but then you have to obviously build trust on it so that's both like attracting capital to kind of like interact in the economy um, and then also just selecting great judges that can be part of this court um, and then kind of like writing a constitution for nation three and you know getting citizens to ratify it and then gradually introduce some uh, law that is needed for, for things to function and then there's of course kind of like once you have that, you, you can uh, start acquiring more citizens and creating like, a critical mass and maybe providing some other services like, like UBI. Um, and then in that process, you're going to strengthen your governance system even more. And, and then at some point, uh, like one, one thing that is, of course, really important is kind of like backing other plays and other kind of like um, startups and networks that are working on diseases. So kind of like launching some kind of VC fund if, if community approves or some kind of like venture arm in general seems very important. And then and then you can focus kind of like on, on the synergistic relationship between one and the other. You can find things that are great to create a better kind of like jurisdiction and a better place for trade on the internet. And then as trade emerges and you build a stronger treasury, you can then even fund more tools, more common goods, um, more teams working on, on key stuff. And then at some point is when you start kind of like having leverage to negotiate. Uh, special economic area and then and then you do that and then you start literally landing on land and can bring in all the learnings and all of this like you know solar punk state you have built from a blank slate into land and then there are a bunch of other challenges that arise right uh, when it comes to land and a bunch of other things you need to fund um, we need of course some kind of open source modular architecture um, it, and you need like you know better education systems and so forth and right now we're kind of like focusing on the very, very, very meta. We also um, created our own kind of like super set of markdown for legal agreements that we think is going to like make legal agreements way better and more understandable and introduces kind of like open source concepts like dependency tracking or imports uh, to legal definitions so that you can import uh, a legal definition done by other practitioner or you can use reuse agreements as like open source packages. And so we're focusing on this very meta layer that then you can build a bunch of stuff on top and hopefully in five years, um, you can start actually leveraging the system, but on land and, and actually building things that are way more efficient, like a hundred X more efficient, fairer and with um, better checks and balances where people can actually live. Cool. Well, thanks so much. It's very exciting. I think this is like a super important area and this is going to be, uh, yeah, an area where I'm sure we're going to see a good, a lot of activity and it's needed, right? I think it's very clear, right? That nation states today are kind of not really cutting it. And and so I'm, I'm super excited that you're both working on something new and something different. And I hope I hope you'll be able yeah. to take it forward. I mean, one, one, one thing here, I think I think like not cutting it is, is definitely, um, it, it definitely touches the point, but I think it's, it's even way more than that. Like. If we don't do anything right now, the default state of the world is oblivion. 
like the default state of the world is that our institutions are completely decadent. They cannot even handle stuff like climate change. They cannot handle like stuff that is going to literally make our uh, our whole population extinct. So if they cannot even handle that, of course, don't ask them to like handle all their stuff. Um, and and you know if you think about Southern Europe, I'm, I'm from Spain, and the same in Portugal, and the same in like half of the you know quote unquote uh, first world in in Western Europe, like things just don't work. Like they just don't work, period. Um, but it's not even about like user experience or having a smooth experience. No, it's that we are like at the brink of destroying the planet and burning it. Um, and we are at the brink of a nuclear war. So like how we have gotten ourselves to this is completely mind blowing. And right now there is no other answer than to work on renewing these corrupt institutions. Like literally if we don't do anything, we are uh, default dead and we want to be default alive. So um, if you want you know, to, to, to see the humankind prosper, this is the only rational thing you can really do. Question is, Brian, are you moving to the nation three territories once we have them? Have we convinced you? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I may. I'll definitely consider it. <laughs> we'll make sure that it's going to be warm and, and nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, it has been super fun. Thank you so much for amazing questions and and glad to have you as an incoming citizen and once we have the, the territories and everything. Um, yeah, as Louis said, I think it's super important to focus on this now and we don't really have another choice. So that's, um, that's that small task <laughs> ahead of us. Absolutely. No, thanks so much for coming on. I'm, I'm looking forward to following it. And, and of course, if people want to check it out, right? So it's, a, I mean, we're going to put a bunch of links in the show notes, but it's also nation3.org. And then I guess it can become a citizen, right? Which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty affordable at this point. So uh, what's, what's the status right now? Like how many citizens do you have and what does the community look like? And we have 178 um, as of today. And the community is really cool. There are very cool philosophical discussions. Uh, there's a lot of building going on, like open source contributors. We are the second largest DAO on the org when it comes to bounties uh, and kind of like people just contributing. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's quite, quite nascent. Cool, fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Luis and Anastasia for coming on. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And thanks so much for our listeners for tuning in. If you want to support the show, make sure to leave us an iTunes review. It helps new people find the show. And yeah, then we look forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs>